Welcome back. Hope you guys had a great, great weekend. Um, and that you're all doing really, really well. Um, all right. So for science, we are on lessons three and four um, on oceans. So I've kind of filled the board with information that's most important on those two lessons. Um, again, a pretty cool topic. I'm enjoying this one, I think, the most, maybe. <laughs> Um, so this will be for the week of 420. Got the date in the corner so that you can track that. Um, and this video will help with the week assignment. So again, I'm just, everybody kind of said that one video is easier for them to find and track and use. So it'll be one video for the week for math and one video for the week for science um, on those topics. So it should be good. All right. So what we are going to talk about today are the ocean zones. I've kind of got those bolded. Um, the ocean, ocean organisms and how they're classified. And then we're going to talk over here about um, what's going on with the oceans, some of the threats that are happening now, and then some of the possible solutions. Okay. Um, it was nice to see a lot of you guys on Zoom the other day. I really enjoyed that. So I'll do another one. We'll stick to Fridays at one o'clock. So that's kind of going to be my go-to time. Okay. So join if you can. It was really fun. Uh, to catch up with you guys and talk about fun stuff and laugh a lot and um, answer any questions you had for me. Um, keep passing them my way. Don't forget to message, okay, all the time, anytime. Um, first thing we're going to cover would be the ocean zones. Um, so I kind of drew that out. The notes that I've made have, have much better pictures on them, so and they're much more in-depth. So don't forget that the notes for the entire chapter that we're on, which is Chapter 2 now, Oceans, out of your book, um, this entire chapter is in, is really nicely laid out in my notes. So those are online under topic two for water and atmosphere. And you'll see, it'll say complete notes, chapter two, unit two. Okay. So go there for, um, to check those out because they're pretty great. The YouTube videos also same location and they're all dated. Okay. Um, so we're talking about the different zones where organisms live. We have the intertidal zone, which I've kind of colored in um, a purplish color here for you. That's that little bit, once the water starts, so kind of where the tides come in, the where that hits, once the water starts there, it's this kind of brief section um, of water um, that is called the intertidal zone, okay? So inter meaning between tides. Neuritic zone is in the red here, and that's the zone right after the intertidal, still um, you know, not too deep at that, at that location. Um, and then once it drops off, we go into what's called the deep ocean zone. Okay. So again, that's intertidal is the purple. Um, I'm going to talk about those colors. So that's why I'm pointing them out. Intertidal is the purple. Neuritic zone is the red. And then the deep ocean zone is that drop off where the continental, um, edge kind of goes down there. You can see the deep ocean zone. All right, so, and that'll be green, so I'll use those in a minute, too. Um, actually, we'll talk about them right now. Um, so organisms that need light for, photo, they, um, for photosynthesis. Um, obviously, the only way that you can get the most light um, is to be toward the upper part of the ocean, right? Um, and we talked about that, that deep in the water, those creatures can withstand very little to no sunlight. Um, but organisms that have to have light for photosynthesis, which you know from a, a previous lesson that that's how they create their food, right? Um, they would be located at these locations, the intertidal, so that was the purple, right? Because they're going to be closer to the surface to get the light. And also in the neuritic zone, because that is still not yet into the deep zone. So these, these creatures kind of hang out up there and they're able to get that sunlight from the sun's rays a little bit easier by going to the top, staying at the top. So that was, that's what the I stands for and that's what the N stands for, intertidal zone and neuritic zone. Again, really um, clear on the notes too, so you can check those out. Now, the intertidal zone, which again was right at the start, is if there were to be any shoreline changes or shoreline damage with the rocks, the sand, um, things like erosion, we talked about last lesson, um, things like that, that is the intertidal zone will be the one that sees the most damage and feels the most damage. 
because of, well, maybe not necessarily damage, but they will feel that change. They're much more impacted by the change because they're up against where the tides come in and the tides can have a huge impact on the rocks and all the surrounding um, area in that, in that location. So the intertidal zone would again be the one that you would see the most impact with shoreline changes. That zone is most impacted and those creatures and plants that might be living in that area are most affected by those shoreline changes. But now we go deeper into the ocean, right? Into the deep depths, the deep ocean zone. The organisms that can withstand pressure, a lot of pressure, um, would be in the deep ocean zone. Now we read that article on, I'm gonna forget how to say the scientific name, but the fish that we just talked about, the funky looking fish that lives um, quite deep in the Pacific Ocean, where they had to send the ROV down to actually um, be able to get footage on why it had that, the bizarre construction of the head that it had and what function that was and how it survives. Uh, that's an example of a creature that lives in the deep ocean zone. Um, though the deep ocean zone, so the green, kind of coated like I said, um, is also the least impacted by shoreline changes. And you can kind of imagine why. Um, we talked about it too with wave motion, something that is like a little boat that might be, it might be a rough day out on the ocean. And let's say there's a sailboat out there or whatever it might be. Um, and they're kind of bobbing around and they're feeling that wave motion, which again is circular, right? Um, because of the energy that's being created. But deep down, um, something I think I used the example before of the sunken pirate ship, um, that debris down there doesn't really feel the effects at all because of the massive amount of depth between the top in the bottom and that's kind of what is happening here. Any kind of shoreline changes that are happening up here in the intertidal zone, there's these creatures can withstand that because there's not much, they're really not impacted by those shoreline changes because they're very, very, very far away from it in most cases, okay? And remember the ocean can go, if some of you remember, about the size of two Grand Canyons, which is pretty massive. Um, so just to kind of give you a feel that how far away that they are. Um, and that's why, again, they can withstand the pressure in the deep ocean zone and they're less impacted by any shoreline changes. Um, so that's kind of the key points in that section. Um, let's go over here. Um, and then I'll talk about why I had to squeeze in food web over there, but I'll talk about that at the, at the, toward the end. Um, so how do scientists, how have they figured out how to classify um, the ocean organisms. And there's some cool words that are probably new to, a couple of them new to you maybe. Plankton, you probably have heard before. We've talked about it before, I know. Those are the tiny little microscopic. We've used that word a lot this year. Microscopic meaning that we would need a microscope to see them. Um, they're very, very tiny. Not all of them. There are plankton you can see with the naked eye, um, but there are a lot that are microscopic. And they also can float. So you'll see plankton um, kind of up near the upper zones um, because some of them can be plants, plant type structures, plant type organisms. They're gonna be up at that neuritic intertidal zone because what do they have to get for photosynthesis? They need the light. So plankton will kind of float around to where they need to be in order to be able to survive, reproduce, that sort of thing. Now, nekton are the free swimming um, organisms and they will go up and down the water column. If you remember in, I think it was two videos ago, um, we talked about the water column and how you had kind of a smaller section, a bigger section, and then the deep ocean and how the temperatures get colder and that sort of thing. Um, these creatures can swim up and down between those zones pretty easily. And so I put some examples on here. Um, many fish can float in between those zones, swim in between those zones, squid, whales, and seals. So there's a there's kind of a wider zone that they can travel, okay? And then benthos, benthos meaning bottom, um, near the ocean bottom, so those creatures live there, and you probably know this, crabs, sea stars, octopus, and sea anemones are examples of benthos organisms. So all the organisms in the ocean ecosystem um, are divided in, in between these categories, plankton, nekton, or benthos, depending upon where they live and um, how they function, that sort of thing, and how they move is another one. All right. All right.
right, moving on to what's going on with our oceans. Why are, is there such concern? Um, why has there been well, of concern for probably a long time now? Um, the largest issue that's going on would be global warming. We've talked about this before, but just to kind of rehash that, global warming is when the Earth's temperatures um, are rising. Because, it could be because of various reasons. Um, one reason um, is that the sea level is rising and what happens to salt water is it can kind of expand. So um, when the temperatures of the earth heat up um, and so what happens is that the oceans tend to take up more space a bit over time. And so that's why we're seeing the sea levels rise. That's one of the reasons why we're seeing that. Um, but global warming really has to do with the, a lot of the human impact that we're putting um, on the earth um, especially our cars, the gases that the cars give off. Um, if you, that's a huge one. Um, any kind of carbon dioxide related and other pollutants that might be in the air. Okay, that is what causes, it basically is destroying parts of the atmosphere and causing the earth to heat up a lot faster than it would. We also have more intense sun rays. We talked about that a huge chunk at the beginning of the year, um, how the sun, where the earth is situated um, and where the sun is and its impact and what's happening with the sun, right? And um, all our discussions about Mars and, and all that current, all the current news that's going on with that. So the sun is definitely getting hotter slowly over time. And that's another reason why we see temperature, um, temperatures rise. And that affects the organisms definitely in the ocean um, because they kind of need a, you know, a varied, um, amount of temperature to keep that ecosystem going. And there are certain creatures um, that need pretty specific temperatures in order to stay alive. And if they are, um, if they go extinct or reduce greatly in their number, then that can really affect, um, we're going to talk about a food web in a minute, but that can really affect a food web and then it impacts every other animal as you've learned probably in many years past. Um, so with global warming, some things we can do is maybe take a walk instead of um, using our cars. Actually seeing a lot of that now given the situation we're in, you see a lot of people walking versus being in their cars and get, getting to place to place. So that's a, that's a good thing about what's happening right now is we're kind of taking a little bit better care of our environment. Um, keep your thermostat down. Oh, I am always freezing. It is freezing right now in this studio, my, I feel like my hands are blue and I've got my coffee. Um, I love to put the heat up in my house. Uh, my husband does not. <laughs> um, so, but keeping the thermostat down is my, I do try, I try to bundle up. Um, it does help. And so anything, any, any kind of energy saving things you can do will help with that. Okay. Um, number two, pesticides. We've talked about these because we talked about it during, um, unnatural eutrophication, right? Even if you remember that from the large science assignment, eutrophication, it sounds like it starts with a U, it's the one that starts with E-U-T-R, da 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 da. Um, that's where you have the algae buildup. Um, it, it, when it happens naturally, um, that's just because of decomposition and sometimes um, the algae just blooms so much that it creates this surface, this sort of green surface algae and then eventually fills in over time unnatural eutrophication example that I was looking for on that assessment, um, or assignment I should say, um, is pesticides. Um, pesticides are a type of chemical that they use in agriculture. Um, some are better than others. Um, however, what happens is that they leach into um, lakes, which could cause the unnatural eutrophication to happen way faster than it would naturally. Um, what can we do about this? Because we need our farms, right? We love our farms. We, we wouldn't have what we, much of our food, um, especially the healthy stuff, if we didn't have our farms. So a lot of farmers are starting to use safer products, um, safer types of pesticides to keep the bugs away and keep the crops growing. Um, but those pesticides can leach into lakes, streams, waters, rivers, and eventually the oceans and definitely have an impact on the organisms that live there. Um, number three is invasive species. This one is most interesting to me and there's a lot about this out there. Um, we have to be cautious about what we are adding into any body of water. Um, it can definitely alter the ecosystem a lot. Um, so for example, if 
you know, we have a lot of fishermen that go out to get all of our great seafood that we see at markets and all over the place. Um, however, sometimes when they're fishing in different areas, things can get caught, different types of fish can get caught into a net. And if something happens and that fish is on that boat and somehow is transferred um, to another area and that fish sort of, they reproduce and they take over, it can really alter the ecosystem of that particular um, waterway or, or body of water. Okay, so invasive species are the ones that um, basically invade an ecosystem where they would not naturally have been. And um, again, it can knock out a certain other species of fish or creature or plant that depends upon another and the whole food web is shifted, that ecosystem is shifted. Um, all right, so that's invasive species. We have something called overfishing, which is exactly like it sounds. It just means that people fish too much. We are overfishing. Um, and, you know, a lot of that um, is there's, they're trying to put out product. So, you know, if they're looking to get the shrimp, then they're going to get the shrimp. Um, the problem with overfishing is it's hard to ensure that um, rules and regulations are being held to by the different companies that are out there doing the fishing for us. Um, so one way we can kind of protect that is to extend sort of the laws that are um, would protect a certain area. So um, an example would be if, if we stretched, you know, another two miles of some location or hundreds of miles of some location and said, this is now being protected. Um, you, you know, you cannot fish here. That's one way why we, where we could help overfishing. Um, overfishing will greatly reduce the amount of species that are in the water. And again, it goes back to the food web. If we're fishing for tuna, let's say, um, and too much tuna is taken from an area, we are overfishing. We are screwing up that ecosystem, uh, that food web. Um, so we have to, another kind of um, thing I put down here was the rule of limit catch. So over a certain period of time, they may allow a fishing boat to go out and collect, um, you know, a certain weight of fish for a certain time period, like I said. So um, to limit their catch would help to keep the supply of species at bay. In other words, that it still it st would still exist and it would still be there and it would still be able to support the ecosystem. We're not pulling too much out. Okay. Um, a cool thing I was reading about is the predators. So if you think about an ocean and let's say a fishing boat was out and caught a shark in the net when they didn't mean to. Let's say they were fishing for something else or some other species where it is more of a top predator. Um, that can really shift, as you well know, a whole food web. So it's, it's really all back to this food web over and over again. Um, and what else? Let me catch in then, oh, using proper equipment and methods. So sometimes people go out and use massive nets that wouldn't be ones that um, that people who try to protect our oceans would recommend, like the size might be bigger, it might be a different type. There's something called trawling, which is where they will take nets and sort of let them sit, the boat will still be moving and they'll let it sit in the water and it'll capture as much fish as possible. That's one thing they say is not so great for the ecosystem because you're pulling out so much at one time um, to use that method. So that's one method they're trying to get people to sort of stray away from. And I put et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because I think I had seven or eight examples that I've been reading about and researching, and they're all on the online notes just because I ran out of room there. But um, our oceans definitely need to be protected. So there's also some ideas of what you guys can do in addition, like plastic, you know, not... Um, not throwing your plastic or letting it kind of go into the ocean or in the land for that matter and getting caught on, you know, an animal. We know that, right? Um, things like that. And then when you're out boating, you know, thinking about the recreational activities you're doing um, that might impact or not impact the ecosystem. You know, something like taking a, a canoe out, you know, into nature, of course, kind of a prob probably a better choice than going on speedboats for the whole day where you have fuel and um, the gas and stuff that could have could affect the creatures that are living there so um, so there's more examples online okay and then I already talked about the food web 
had to write it this way because I'm running out of space, but a food web, as you all already know, is the feeding relationships between any ecosystem. In our case, we're talking about the oceans. There is a really in-depth one that I put on the notes that for an ocean with killer whales and different types of whales and plankton and that. Um, you can take a look at that. Um, it's much better than what I would be able to fit or draw on here, so check that out. And with that, that is essentially lessons three and four. Um, in case you notice in your book, um, Lesson four became something that I created that I wanted to um, kind of join up with Mrs. Clark on because I know she's, again, talking a lot about the oceans and protecting them and damage that's done. So I wanted to create a lesson four that really tied into that. Um, so that will be part of an assignment that you guys will do this week. Um, but in case you look in the book, the lesson four in the book is not... Um, focused on threats or solutions. It's something I just kind of created on my own. So just in case you're wondering, this lesson four looks a lot different, that's why. Okay, um, and then there's one lesson we're skipping for now, um, and then we'll, we'll go back to at some point, but one little one that we didn't need at this point that we'll go back to. Um, and that's it. So you guys will use, hopefully the way that we're doing assignments is working really well for you. Um, at the Zoom meeting, um, that I recently saw many of you at. It sounded like you like that everything is released on a Monday and then you have the full week to do those at your own pace. Um, if you're someone who does, who would prefer it to be broken down better, I can work with you on that. And um, if you prefer it to be, you know, a two day due date or whatever it might be, um, let me know and I can change up specifically a schedule for you if that helps you track it better. So just let me know if you're having trouble tracking it. You will see the end date though for all my assignments as Sunday. Um, you can start them as soon as they're released as many of you do. I see a lot of people doing them the first day which is great. Um, you don't have to rush to do them but just also don't wait till the weekend um, unless you're kind of saving my stuff for for last. Okay so um, but like I said, I'll continue to give you the full week and everything will be released on Mondays. If you have questions, you know where I am. Um, watch the videos first. I'm gonna say that probably 42 times too as I go through these. Um, I, I can tell when um, someone is really lost and the first question I often ask is, are you watching the videos? And usually they're going, oh, I forgot about the videos or I didn't know that they were there. Okay, so watch the videos. They definitely will help and you can watch them as much as you want over and over again, especially for math. Okay, and the notes online, of course. And I think that's it. So with that, I will let you guys go and get busy and um, try to enjoy the day and let me know if you have any questions. Take care.